Okay, welcome to Computer and Network Security. Uh, today's topic is on recent threats and attacks. So what I'm going to go through in this lecture are a few of the uh, different attacks uh, types and how we can classify some of them. I'll go through a couple of uh, recent attacks that have happened and then point you to uh, a few websites if you're interested in uh, learning about some other attacks and how you can keep up on uh, current uh, viruses and malware and hoaxes and so on uh, that happen through the internet. Okay, so start off with cyber attacks. Uh, just to give you a little foundation in this, the number of cybersecurity incidents involving critical infrastructure systems rose 2,000% between 2009 and 2011. And the number involving federal government rose by 39%. And uh, you can just see just the sheer numbers of cyber attacks that we have, over 56,000 phishing attacks. I'm sure that many of us uh, get them on a daily basis, even with spam filters uh, and uh, the email servers that have spam filters and phishing filters installed in them, uh, we still get them. Some still come through. I probably get at least two or three of them a day that come through asking uh, for me to enter uh, some information on a website. Uh, a lot of times it says something along the lines of um, that the, the amount of storage space that I have on the server has been exceeded and I have to uh, log in here to verify, otherwise they're going to uh, deactivate my email account. So that's one uh, phishing email. Uh, and there's a lot of them that come through all the time. Uh, so I'm sure that you have seen those. And then the number of Trojans, viruses, and worms, uh, a little over 11,000 um, that uh, we have annually. So a lot of viruses and we have companies like McAfee and Symantec that uh, focus on trying to make sure that our computers stay safe and trying to stay uh, one step ahead of all of the hackers. Okay, two different types of attacks. We have technology-centric attacks and non-technology-centric attacks. The technology-centric ones are the ones that uh, we've kind of been talking about. Spam, malware, hacking, denial of service attacks, phishing, click fraud, violation of digital property rights. Okay, these are all technology-centric. Uh, the non-technology-centric uh, are a little bit harder to deal with a lot of the times. Online theft, scams and frauds, uh, physical harm, cyberbullying. This is a really big topic recently uh, with uh, kids having so much access to the Internet and how cyberbullying happens, um, spreading false information, online gambling. So there's uh, a lot of online gambling is illegal and uh, who knows if the website you're using isn't fraudulent anyways and that they're going to be taking your money or that uh, there's uh, the, the decks are stacked. Who knows if you're playing against real players or whether you're playing against computers and uh, that you're not going to win. Um, <coughs> aiding crime so there's a, there's a lot of issues here, um, and a lot of these aren't only targeted at children, but they could be um, taken to the level of having kids, especially as kids start to get older, that they just don't have the understanding of all of the potential problems. And um, so they can really get themselves into trouble, especially if the parents are entrusting them with credit cards, uh, which is often the case as kids become teenagers nowadays, that they have credit cards. Um, and so they can have a lot of problems uh, with that also, which are the non-technology centric. So these are just some of the problems, some of the ways that we classify them uh, on the internet. So hacktivism, it's a relatively new word, uh, which is uh, a word that some of these hacking organizations, uh, the news media has coined for that we have these hacking agencies, these organizations like Anonymous and Lulsac, where they, they don't, um, they don't reveal their identities. They're not trying to make personal gain out of what they do. Um, it's more for uh, like protesting. So you see the third bullet point that I have there, protesting, such as to uh, the SOPA, uh, the act that was tried to pass, tried to be passed by uh, the U.S. government, uh, Scientology. Um, and uh, there was uh, one not too long ago also about um, some drug cartel in Mexico and uh, Anonymous actually focused on uh, making sure that uh, someone's child who had been kidnapped would uh, get back successfully because of uh, things that they were doing just completely online uh, to some of these drug cartels. Defacing websites, stealing data, uh, drawing attention to security holes. So these, these organizations aren't necessarily out to hack for personal gain, uh, but they're more out to um, 
try to do what they think is good uh, through, um, I don't know, something that may even be classified as vigilante justice, uh, just taking the law into their own hands to go out and uh, take care of problems, to, to right the wrongs in the world as they see it. Okay, phone hacks. Uh, this is an interesting one and, and one that, that may become very relevant in, in uh, the near future. Uh, being able to spoof phone numbers, get voicemail access. There's uh, technology out there already called Spoof Card. It helps to mimic a phone number. And uh, as a lot of you may know, there are general phone numbers that you can call from a, a cellular provider uh, or even from a landline. And all you have to do is know the uh, voicemail password and the phone number and you'd be able to get into it. Well, you don't even need that if you have the spoof card. It's going to be acting like it's the phone, so even if you can't call into it from a landline, you could be calling into it from a phone and uh, actually be spoofing uh, that phone number so it can appear as if it's coming from somebody else. So that's one way you can get access to voicemail. You could uh, appear as if you're somebody else. If you're calling a number and you're spoofing the uh, phone number, then uh, that person is going to know that it's from you. So you can look up a spoof card and uh, read, read some more about that. Uh, installing root kits on phones, getting access to pictures, videos, phone numbers, contact information, things like that, that are on phones. Uh, this originally came out and became a little bit bigger in the, the media because uh, celebrities were being targeted with this. And uh, people were able to get the pictures that celebrities had on their phones. They were able to get phone numbers. And uh, when you got into uh, one of their phone books, their contact lists, uh, they were able to get a lot of different phone numbers that may have been stored there that other people didn't have access to. So um, a lot of our smartphones nowadays are running as, um, as computers. I saw something that said that we have uh, our, our smartphones nowadays, actually uh, the CPU that's inside of them is more powerful than the CPU that was on the first uh, space shuttle that made it to the moon. So uh, we have a lot of processing power that we all carry around with us in our pockets and uh, they're going to be targeted. They already are starting to be, and they're going to continue to be. So uh, phone security is probably something that uh, we need to keep in the back of our minds as we're um, using our phones. So I'm just going to go through a uh, couple different attacks. Um, first one is My Doom. It was in 2004. At the time, it was considered the fastest spreading email worm ever. Uh, the subject lines were very generic, uh, things that we all see and probably take note of air, mail, mail delivery system. Uh, we see these, these subject lines all the time, and there was an attachment on it. And um, if the attachment was executed, the worm was then sending itself to contacts in the address book. And if uh, Kaza was uh, installed on the computer, which was a popular peer-to-peer -peer sharing software, uh, then it was also being shared across that network. So it spread very, very quickly uh, because of peer-to-peer -peer and because of contacts in the address book through email. And what it did, there were two versions of it. The first one installed the back door and launched a denial of service attack against the SCO group. So SCO is uh, a company, it's in um, Santa Cruz, California, I believe. And uh, there were some talks that this company was targeted because uh, in some legal proceedings that they had, they actually were uh, speaking against Linux. So there was some talk that this was coming from a Linux activist group uh, for this. Uh, that, so this company was attacked uh, a lot of a lot of um, these worms were being sent back to uh, the SCO group and um, denying them service, denying them access to uh, the internet because there were just so many requests that were coming back since it spread so quickly. And then uh, it was also uh, another one, MyDoom.B, was launched uh, as a denial of service attack against Microsoft, and uh, this one was pretty. This is pretty bad also when it's able to alter the host file on your computer. So when you alter the host file. Uh, you're able to uh, spoof that you think that you might be going to one website when in fact you're going to a different one. If they uh, do this for like a banking website, Bank of America or Alaska, USA, Wells Fargo, something like that, and they've spoofed the web page on the front side, it's going to look like you're actually on that web page. It's even going to have that URL when you type it in uh, at the top. However, you're actually going to be hitting a different IP address, and if they have the page that looks exactly the same, chances are people are going to log in and they've just given up their uh, username and password for uh, their bank account. Uh, I saw a really good one uh, not too long ago that was uh, mimicking eBay and the site looked spot on. I, it looked exactly the same and so when you went there with eBay you were able to actually see everything uh, that was there. So uh, I mean so that when you logged in it actually redirected you to eBay. However 
your username and password was just retrieved by uh, this uh, hacking, uh, this uh, virus site, whoever that may have been. A lot of times with these sites also what they do is they're going to go out and uh, register a domain name and use it for maybe about a couple days until their virus really uh, hits the market and it's all gone and then they're not going to be using that domain anymore. So they're very, very short registrations. Uh, they may look very similar to other sites. So instead of going to Microsoft, you're going to Microsoft, but the T and the F are switched at the end or something like that. And some people might not even notice it. They just look up in the top and it looks kind of the same, if they even look at the top. Uh, a lot of people may not even look up there. It's very important. This is why uh, with uh, a lot of the email scams, uh, if you get anything, even when I get anything from my banking website and it's got links in it that I can click on and it'll take me directly to my site, I don't even do that. I usually uh, will just go into the browser and type my bank account, my bank uh, URL, and then I'll log in directly from there rather than uh, clicking anything in email just because you don't know uh, if any of those are phishing and uh, it just saves me a little bit of time not having to check and make sure uh, that I'm going to the right site. So. <clears throat> little advice there for you. Okay, uh, this next one, a uh, little bit newer, in February of 2010, uh, there was a, um, a Trojan called Fake Alert AV Soft, and this Trojan just gave fake alerts to uh, the compromised system. So fake balloon tips would pop up, they'd be provided when you click on it, the user would be prompted to buy fake antivirus software, it modified the registry, and uh, it was transmitted through uh, email and websites also for uh, some downloads. So. Um, uh, this one is uh, something that some of you may have also seen. Uh, I've seen on my computers even that uh, if you do get some kind of a virus or it looks like you've got a virus, what it'll do is it'll pop things up and say, uh-oh, your computer's infected with XYZ virus. And uh, good news, though, here, go to this URL, pay $29.95, we'll get rid of it right away for you. Well, with this fake alert AV soft, the only thing that it really did was modify the registry and had this little program running in the background. It actually wasn't even doing anything to the computer, so it was low risk that uh, there was no real concern. Uh, what it was trying to do was just get you to uh, buy some fake antivirus software, but there was nothing, nothing that was really causing any problems on your computer. So if you didn't mind having these little balloon tips pop up, uh, you could probably could have left the virus on there and it wasn't doing anything. Uh, but the antivirus programs came out and uh, fixed that for us. So uh, that was nice. Uh, okay, so those are the only uh, threats that I'm going to go through, the recent ones. Uh, I found a lot of information. I was going through a lot of uh, uh, different uh, recent threats on these two sites. McAfee and Symantec are probably two of the most popular um, uh, antivirus and uh, malware, uh, anti-malware vendors on the market. So uh, hopefully you've heard of them. If not, uh, you should learn a little bit about them. They're two uh, very large companies. And uh, they do good work. So uh, there has been some, some conjecture that uh, these companies actually produce viruses just to keep themselves in business. And uh, that is uh, not true. So, um, and they also do not hire people who produce viruses. That's also uh, a rumor that if you are a hacker that you can get hired by these companies. Uh, they don't want to hire hackers. It's actually harder to um, combat viruses than it is to write viruses. So they try to hire people who are even better than uh, the virus writers. So, uh, all right, so that's it for, uh, oh, one more. One more slide on this lecture. Legality, have to mention this. I've told you from the very beginning, you're gonna learn things in this class that you could use uh, to do some illegal things. So I just wanted to point out here, when it comes to viruses, malware, uh, compromising networks and so on. Most states have a law similar to this one here. Uh, I pulled this one actually from uh, um, uh, Alaska. A person who without authorization gains or attempts to gain access to and alters, damages, destroys, discloses, or modifies any computer, computer network, computer property, computer system, computer program, computer data, or software, and thereby causes damage to another or obtains money, property, information, or a benefit for any person without legal right is guilty. And it goes on to express all of the different uh, laws and statutes for which you may be held liable. So uh, keep that in mind that this is, it is illegal to write viruses, even if uh, it's not really doing much, not really causing a problem other than uh, costing people time uh, when it gets into companies who um, uh, people are paid and uh, their time is valuable, that anything that you do which is considered malicious, um, trying to get in unauthorized access or gaining something, uh, that it is going to be illegal 
and you can be held liable and it's not only a fine uh, a lot of these actually would uh, be jail or even prison time for somebody so uh, hopefully you all will use your knowledge for good rather than evil and uh, try to make this world a little bit better place even if it is through uh, antivirus technology or just not partaking in the uh, creation of malicious software okay that's it for this lecture talk with you all soon